Hi, I'm Paul. Hi, I'm Karen. And welcome to Cave Escape Episode 2. Um, today we're looking at the Volkswagen story that recently came out about the 11 million diesel vehicles that were fitted with a defeat device, uh, rigging emission tests uh, that was announced on September the 18th this year. Um, it's a very interesting story, Kieran. Uh, I'm not sure how you feel about it so far. It's uh, it's kind of developed further and it, it's it's manipulated itself to or manifested itself to a new form. This is a story that. These cars, when they were tested, uh, had a defeat device that switched them to a low emissions mode, which would then turn off when the car was on the road. Uh, this, this meant that when the cars left the shop, left the garage, or left the regulator's test, they were actually doing 40 times the permitted level of NOx, nitrogen oxide uh, gas, into the air. They're letting off 40 times the permitted level. Uh, VW shares have now fallen 40% uh, with... Newspapers like The Guardian reporting that 5.3 million of petrol and diesel cars are Volkswagens, which would take up quite a proportion of the 11 million that have a defeat device. Um, and Britain's Transport Minister, Patrick, I believe Patrick McLaughlin, uh, has even come out and said that the, the Britain will now kind of uh, face this, this problem with, with vehicle manufacturers and, and get rid of it. It's a brilliant story. Uh, I, th- I think it kind of, kind of reaches through various levels in history, uh, regulation and corporations, and it touches many subjects. It's very current. It's, it's quite a shock as well. It's, just, it's been really, it's really gripping. I'm not actually sure it's been getting as much uh, kind of coverage as it should do. One of the key facts that I found out about the other day or other week, casually in my own time, was that actually in London, 9,500 people die each year. Uh, due to uh, nitrogen oxide, so it, it, it's very it's wow, very I, important. I did not yeah. know that. I did not know that. that's crazy. Yeah, it's a god statistic. We've also now come out with the Samsung TV problem, which is that Samsung TVs also are possibly non energy efficient, and there seems to be a chain reaction of events coming out that show us corporations, specifically in terms of environmental control, uh, are deceiving the public, which is fascinating. It's also quite scary. Uh, I don't know how you feel about Kieran. Well, it's I, I hate to be uh, I hate to be that overly cynical guy, but it really it just really didn't surprise me. <laughs> and um, it's not not that I I follow uh, car emissions tests so closely that I knew this sort of scandal was was bound to come out due to the fact that all the you know all the legal and illegal ways they they uh, they avoid emissions tests. But I think. At a very basic level, public corporations, right? So they're, uh, I mean, in the US um, and, and, and the UK and I think around a lot of the West now, they're, in, they're entsh- enshrined in law to make profit, uh, to make their company as profitable as, as possible. And if they can't do that in any um, legal way, they tend to, you know, risk a more illegal way. Now, this is a very sophisticated form of doing it, of fraud, uh, uh, and 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 this is like a prob- most likely seems to be a, a, it's going to be probably some sort of worldwide conspiracy. I know the EU have their own standards of tests compared to the US because this broke in the US, right? It was the US regulators. And, yeah. You know, I was so cynical. One of the first things that came to my mind is, well, it's a German uh, company. They probably they probably didn't bribe the right officials in the US. Or yes, definitely. definitely. Or, well, the, cr- the crazy thing is here is that the EU. They're actually saying it's not their fault. It's down to the nation states or the member states. Sorry to kind of give their actual, do the test properly themselves. And oh, really? it's come out, okay. it's since come out that Britain and I think France and Germany have all had large lobbying to not regulate these tests so, so, so kind of strictly, yes. uh, which is really, which is really worrying. And it's crazy, actually, I kind of find it quite interesting that the US, which is known for lobbying in, in the presidential elections and so on, it's, it's known to have a strong lobbying presence generally it is the country right, that yeah. came out and said this is this is a problem right exactly so the the other cynical part of me thought well which which competitors tip the regulators off to this software yeah. uh, and who 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 didn't they bribe and i'm horrid i'm i'm i'm, I'm apologized to take such a cynical view and, and you know you can take issue of me taking taking a view like that but since the financial crisis and and what happened with the the banking conglomerates or or the banking cartel i think would be more accurate around the world and and their how they were not just let off the hook but 
bailed out and and how very few if any people actually went to jail for all of their fraud and manipulations which went into the trillions and uh, 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 it, it, when I found out about this I thought this is another large corporation doing you know attempting to do what they do best and that sort of circumvent uh, uh, state regulations um, and uh, it, it just wouldn't surprise me if, if they've in a very calculated manner and uh, this is a this is a classic conspiracy by the way people if, if, if by any definition of, of what's happened here it's a conspiracy people have sat down and designed very sophisticated software to 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 at a sp- in a very specific i think it's great it, it reminds me of the kind of cartoons where they there's somebody would have to fake a test and they, they've made some ridiculous device to do it and i, could, right. I just have that kind of you know that classic image of you know in spy movies and they put a device on the bottom of the car that beeps and it's a tracking device i kind of feel the same way about this and you know it's an exaggerated thing that's just cruelly sticking out and nobody notices it's, it's crazy i'm never it's, it's a absolutely another level of, of defooling the people and it comes talking to the banks it comes at that time when the banks uh have just had it announced that that the ppi claims Right. They missold that that they have a that consumers have a deadline in which yeah. they can make that complaint. I think right, it's two thousand eighteen. Right. But it's just interesting that this happens in so many different industries on a global level. It's not just that this has happened in America, it's happening because this company is trans transnational, mm-hmm. it's happened in loads of countries and it's all at once. So right, yeah. and at least it, it, it directly leads to people dying, which is even even crazier. You know, it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's actually um, uh, actually that important to us. You know, we don't really see. I, I'm not really talking about climate change now. We don't we don't necessarily. I think we sort of realize the kind of effect the climate change has on our daily lives. But this, you know, because it, it lets cars that, that do 40 times the permitted level of nitrogen oxide, they they release that much nitrogen oxide. That directly leads, probably directly contributes to the 9,500 people who die each year in London due to nitrogen oxide. Um, it, it's horrible. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a classic problem and it's a very difficult problem. Uh, and, you know, how one deals with that. Some, you know, some people would say, well, you need a stronger um, uh, state mechanisms to, to, to manage yeah. these um, these issues. Others, you know, are from another tinge, a very free market tinge, will say that, well, look, uh, um, this is horrible. Volkswagen do- uh, is, has done. Let's nobody buy Volkswagen. The company can't force you to buy their cars and they're going to go under and they're just going to disappear because who wants to buy a car, which is now we know is actively harming one's uh, lungs or, or the you know or the vulnerable people's lungs and, and leading to their to their deaths, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it- it's brilliant. It's at a time as well when gun regulation is debated again. Should you be banning guns? Is regulation going to fix that? Uh, there's arguments for and against, obviously. It's a big debate. Uh, you, you know, it, it makes us question regulation generally. And it's, 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 it's difficult because it's polarizing debate. We're not coming to a good balance. It, it want, is. Yeah. Can I, sorry, go on, Paul. Yep. No, no, I was going to say, actually, I wanted to just lead this onto a story quickly, just to kind of show you the, globe, the kind, of, kind of scale of this issue. Uh, do, you, do you know who Ralph Nader is? Kieran. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, he, he ran for president in the 90s, didn't he? Yeah, I believe so. He was a politician, but originally yeah. he, was, he was an investigative ju- journalist, a very, right. very good yeah. one. And his first big story was about uh, gen- uh, cars in America uh, that were designed for design. They weren't designed for safety. At a time, this is in 1959, this is at a time when there was 5 million deaths annually from car accidents. He released a, uh article called Safe Car You Can't Buy which led on to a, a, a book called Unsafe at Any Speed, published six years later. But this article, the original article, Safe Car You Can't Buy, talks about how in collisions, uh, a flying seat cushion could cause a fatal injury in a car. Uh, there were reports coming out that actually show there's a direct causal relationship between the design of the car and how frequent, severe, and uh, yeah, frequent and severe injuries were. Then he published his book about General Motors cars, Unsafe at Any Speed, which, again, proves similar problems, that there's a large amount of deaths and that the design of cars is leading towards that directly. He actually got harassed for it by General Motors GM and even managed to sue them in 1970 for a breach of privacy, international affliction, 
uh, intentional infliction of severe emotional distress, as well as interference with his economic advantage. Uh, so it, it's just quite an interesting story just to try to encapsulate there as briefly as possible. Yeah. But yeah. but again, this is this is about you know we're now fifty years ago. This came out the story that cars were dangerous and they they, they, were, they were directly leading to deaths. Uh, and this great investigative reporter came out to 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 tell the world about it. Um, and the, the, one of the scary things was that he was consequently tried to harassed as a con- to, to to push him away from reporting more. Uh, it kind of it makes you worry about the the, the power of these companies um, and and the effect they have. You know, they're hiding from us, but they also quite actively dissuade any sort of publication uh, that kind of proves them to be what they are. Well, the good thing is is that in this case, in the, in the recent case, I guess. Volks are going to have come out and made their mistakes and they are trying to fix it. So there's interesting parallels. I don't know what you think, Kieran. I don't know yeah, you... it's true. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's, if they can't bribe you to, to shut up or stop doing your work, they're going to they're figure out even more sinister ways of, of <laughs> doing so. Uh, yeah. And again, I know it's a very cynical approach, but it, rem- it reminds me of the, cigar- uh, the, the, the cigarette companies and the tobacco companies um, and the medical studies and the falsifications and the fact yes. that smoking you know is good for you and the, 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 the amount of money they poured into the, the propaganda of trying to uh, um, dissuade people to believe that either smoking wasn't bad for you it wasn't linked to cancer but of course you know this is all i mean the, the science just kept showing uh, you know when more reputable studies came out again and again but they've just poured so much money into uh into the counter side to try and save their profit margins, and it really, uh, it really shows that sort of quite <sighs> unhuman um, side of, of what you can call modern capitalism. Um, yeah, it's interesting. They, 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 they blind themselves to the, their own the, the human factors of what they do. They, 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 this situation, Volkswagen or General Motors before them, they were thinking about selling as much as quickly as possible, as opposed to the safety of people and. I don't think that's true capitalism. I think capitalism should care about the customer. It should it should try to protect the customer as a consequence and think about their their problems, their their point of view first. Right, that's how I was always right. taught. But this is this is this is kind of some people argue corporatism, where it's come to a point that they're so powerful that they they push the wrong way, regardless of of the effect on the general population. It's just but it's bad business. Folks like have now lost. You know, their, their shares have gone down forty percent. It's not. I it's see not, what you mean. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not a smart way of dealing. You know, to right, forget the right. customer. Yeah, pa- I mean, part of this might might come from from a more a slightly more free market interpretation. Uh, the fact that public corporations, uh, a lot of their, a lot of the value of the companies based on share prices is, I think, a lot of it's valued on quarterly profits. So it's how how much you can do in the next three to four months, basically, before the the, the quarterly profit. Um, uh, m- margin is released and whether that's up or down is going to directly affect the value of the company and the shareholders who own the company and it creates this immense pressure to make short term profits at the expense of long term stab- um, you know, stability or long term uh, uh, gain uh, yeah. uh, there's definitely I'm, sh- I'm sure there's definitely pressures there and that's a really horrible way of doing business and I think in certain other cultures I think still in places like Japan there, um, where there's more family orientation behind most of the corporations still um, even though they have they have their own problems of course there with nepotism and cronyism but 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 they have a, a I think they they still to a certain extent have they take long term planning into account and they're not it's not all about what's happening in the next three to four months and whether we can make X amount of profit so our share value is going to go up and and the CEO and the, all the shareholders are going to pat you on the back and maybe give you a nice bonus uh, for some of these executives so it's the it's that real pressure of well. You know, short term games and, and 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 what we can do about that. I mean, definitely, definitely. Look at the the hacking scandal with with the Sun and News of the World. That was, if you've ever, ever read Nick Davis's book, hmm. Hack Attack. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm not sure if you have, Kieran. I haven't actually. No, no. I've been meaning to lend that to you actually. Anyway, it's a very good book. Uh, it's a bit simplistic in how it's written in terms of it almost polarizes the issue to kind of the Guardian versus everybody else. But it's it's still really amazing journalism. And in the book, he, he, just, he through knowledge he's acquired through interviews and, and, and knowledge he's acquired through transcripts and so on, he tells you how it is in the office of news of the world, you know, how, what the environment was that led to the hacking scandal. And it's awful. It's a kind of bullying atmosphere where they put pressure on you to get the best story. And if you can't get the best story, then, then you're fired or you're bullied. 
eight more. Uh, so people don't want to get bullied more. They don't want to get fired. So they, they go to the greater lengths to get a better story. You know, eventually they get to a point where they hear that there's an investigator who can hack people's phones and get stories from people who are very famous. So they use that and then that spreads. It's like a cancer. It becomes more and more kind of poisonous to the atmosphere and everybody's doing it, you know, and it's, yeah, how, no, it's, it's, it's how it starts, that pressure yeah. to get clear results quickly yeah. and it's awful. And it, it promotes a horrible form of sensationalism as well along with that yes, because yes. you have to grab the public's attention to see yes. more, etc. And I mean, my, um, my auntie told me the other day, actually, I mean, I didn't know, but I think her... Uh, her husband's um, brother, uh, he's an independent journalist and writer, and sometimes he'll get an article uh, published. And, 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 and uh, she says, well, she said to me, unfortunately, it's with uh, institutions such as the Daily Mail, but apparently he's very objective and um, very clear and, and sort of unemotional with his, his writing style and sometimes quite dry, and the editor will get it and they will just sensationalise the whole thing until it's this crazy drama and oh, you know, really? yeah. some of the core facts are left and his writing, you know, elements of his writing still there, but the editors will just completely to try and grab people's attention and, and they'll make it as cheesy and as uh, dramatic as possible before they publish it and, and, and really change his story into the one he wanted to to, to to portray and it's quite shocking that and then that's how you know unfortunately it's a lot of I'm sure a lot of journalism and a lot of a lot of papers a lot of publishers that's the way that's the way it is uh, a lot of them I, I think that's also uh, one of the key things to emphasize there which I'm sure you agree Kieran is that a lot that comes from the public as well the public try to act like it's the worst thing in the world how the papers yeah. <laughs> but they're the ones buying it the yeah, sun exactly, the sun yeah. the sun are awful in how they report but they're also if they're not the most sold paper in the UK, it might be them with Daily Mail. They're one of the top. Yeah. Daily Mail, again, the same same problem. Yeah. The people that people want to hear that they want to, they, you know, but at a time when when journalism is is I think a lot poorer quality than it used to be, and when there's not much money in the press, printed press, because of the internet, essentially, mm-hmm. people have a choice between buying the free sensationalist stuff like the Sun, like Daily Mail, and the Guardian. The Guardian becomes quite tabloidy at times. Uh, they, they'll take that because it's free and that's what they want to hear as opposed to reading something like the FT maybe now which is paid for the International New York Times which I think is also behind a paywall uh, that might not be true actually but, but they, no, no, they, I think it is behind a paywall you're right yes. you, yeah. but they, they, they have they have kept their quality but people don't want to pay for it so they want to they, they're, they're accepting what's worse and free because it's free so you got to turn around and say to yourself would you rather read something that's paid for through commercials and advertisement and we have to share a dilution of quality because it has to appeal to a wider mass pe- mass audience or do you want to take something that's more concentrated and you pay for yourself and you ensure it's quality the quality's there you know uh, they, they wouldn't do this without, if the audience didn't want it um, it's, just, it's just a sad situation where we kind of absorb ourselves and blame and, and blame them it's the same with politicians we say that what they do is wrong and so on but I, I'm Still not sure them, yeah. <laughs> yeah well I'm not sure how selfish we would be in some situations right right no including yeah. myself I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm not devoid of criticism but you know we say the refugee crisis now um, you know would you turn around tomorrow and let, 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 let a refugee stay in, stay in your house you'd probably be a bit a bit worried uh, because of your own selfish reasons and yet I, even though I say that and I've worked with refugees and asylum seekers I will criticise the government for their policy, but I'm not sure how selfless I truly am, you know, and and then we're kind of being hypocritical in some some ways. Right. No, it's it's true. It's very true. I mean, even when it comes to uh, again, I bring in my own my own personal side of it as well. I mean, uh, studying, for example, conflict and 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 from all levels. I mean, it's I I can say I hate conflict. And it, it, it despises me all the war and death, but it's also something extraordinarily exciting and dramatic and that if the world was out with, was without it, I'd be probably rather bored because it's something I, I focus a lot of my studies on and my research. Yeah. And it's a weird, sick relationship where Symbiotic, yeah. I can, I, exactly, where I can criticise it and, and try and say I, I'd, I'd like to figure out ways and help figure out ways to, to, to help resolve some of these issues and, and, and you know, advance ethics to, to a better point. But at the same time, I'm thinking, well, the, you know, the, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without that sort of conflict. And I mean, I have a quite a clear memory in my head as well about this a, a really horrible and, and, and adrenaline rush I got um, when when Russia invade, uh, um, um, went into Crimea. 
Oh, and, that, uh, and when the Ukraine yeah. said they could declare they're mobilizing all their military forces, and I thought, oh my god, this is probably the closest the world's going to be to World War uh, Three in, in in quite a while. Uh, and I must admit, I got the adrenaline rush, and it wasn't like a it wasn't one of terror. It was actually one of excitement. And then I thought, <laughs> what the hell am I? Why am I feeling like this? Because it's not a video game. I'm not playing Call of Duty or yeah, yeah. Sid, Sid Meier's Civilization. Where you know, I mean, this is real people with real lives. And you know, the more I thought about that, I thought, holy crap, this is this is actually quite scary. And I should be more. Worried. But but why did I have that feeling? Is it because I watched the news a lot and you get these things? And the more dramatic it is, and the more exciting you know the world becomes, it's quite horrible. And I mean, I fall into that trap as well. I honestly do. I can criticize paper. It's like the Daily Mail for being sensational. But when sensational events such as, uh, uh, well, um, Russia going into Crimea happen, uh, uh, you know, I'm the one who gets excited about it. Yeah, or, of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's difficult. Yeah, well, again, back to refugees. A, a lot of times rece- people argue, refugee historians, refugee historians argue that there is a difference in reaction between episodes that happen within Europe and the reaction the Europeans give it, and episodes that happen outside of Europe, and the reaction that Europeans give it. So, if there's a refugee crisis and it's not very well covered somewhere in Africa, it's probably going to be much less well received and much less understood by the Europeans than, say, a refugee crisis in the Balkans, which happened. You know, when the yeah. Kosovars and the Bosnians came, it was nearby, so it had a much stronger reaction than anywhere, anywhere else. Um, and it's it deserved the reaction. But there were really bad things happening, and the refugees needed to find asylum. It was a really awful situation. Um, but I think sometimes we as a Western audience can only associate with what we know. So if we see white people getting hurt or whatever, getting, getting, getting attacked, it pulls our heartstrings much more than when it happens in Africa, for instance. Uh, and we kind of disassociate ourselves with what happens there because we don't understand it. When it's close by to us, we start to think, oh, wow, the, I was on holiday there last year. I was in you know, Croatia on holiday, and the people I was friends with are now getting attacked. You know, it feels much more personal. Um, and we definitely try to kind of disassociate and not truly comprehend the, the totality of the situation frequently. So when something happens in Crimea, it's a bit more exciting because it's actually close to us, maybe. Well, I, well, I don't know. Yeah, it's yeah, no, I, I would agree. You're right. I mean, there's definitely those cultural biases, and yeah. I mean, it can get to really extreme points. I mean, especially if if states are involved and looking at it from a foreign policy view, you know, they they can essentially see peoples as unhuman. They don't even recognise them as this is humans that we have to have to worry about and deal with and try our best to to help. It. It's just you know, and, and a very. Um, micro level talking about just just you and i and the general population i i I think you're right if something really horrible happens in in parts of africa or latin america or or parts of asia um because they're still considered other um compared compared to an atrocity or an event happening in 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 europe or or america for example north america uh, and it's really it's really sad why you know why that is and um Part of it must, I think, part of it must have to be with cultural and psychological biases. About, like you said, you've been on holiday. You might have friends and family there. You can relate because they're similar. They have similar values, similar similar looks, even similar looks. You're right, similar looks. The white Europeans. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But it's true. Look at the refugees now. The Syrians. The Lebanon itself is one one tenth of Lebanon's population is refugees. This has been happening for a while in that area, the Middle East. They they are really they are actually not swamped, but they really actually do have a large amount of refugees. So I know right now we have a large amount on our borders. But we didn't pay attention to the refugee crisis until it actually came to the EU, the EU borders, mm. Calais. That's the only time we start to actually, as a, as a people and as a government, to actually start to take notice of the 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 the, the, the kind of awful situation that we're in now. But it's only because it starts to affect us, which is which is sad, but it's also understandable, unfortunately, as well. It's a bit of it's a bit of both. Mm. I find, don't you? I, I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It, it, you're right. It's difficult to 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 sort of self be self reflective, and 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 you have to. You, I mean, you ha- it's something you have to constantly do. You can't just say you are and, and pretend. I mean, you know, it's, yeah. it's going back to points of, of empathy. But if you do sit down and think about what if I was in their position, if I was born there, and this happened to yes. me, then you do generally feel sorry for them. But it's too. It's so easy to slip into, you know. Uh, I and other, and they are other, and and I can't I can't sympathise with them, I empathise with them in the situation that much. Like you said, it's 
they're physically physically so far away. I can't, if they were obviously outside my house, I'd like to think I'd help people who are in need. But these people are so they're you know most from hundreds of miles away and. And, you know, oh, what can I do? Always seems to be the attitude. And sometimes it, it, it is like that. I mean, well, OK, maybe I can give some donate some money and some clothes and some food. Uh, but it, it's easy to forget about it because it's not di- it's not directly impacting on, on your life. Exactly. Exactly. Should we pop on to the next subject, Kieran? What do you think? Yeah, that's up to you. I mean, uh, how long's it been? I mean, we can we can call it a day or we can pop, we can save the, the article for next time. How what do you think? I mean, should we get a quick, quick go, the nuclear tech? I think I think. Yeah, it'd be a, sure. Okay, what do you I think? mean, yeah. all right. I mean, I have to apologize because I've, uh, for, for, for the, the few people who may be listening, I, uh, I had a really a busier week than I thought because my cousin from America um, came came to England uh, on holiday for a, a short Kier- stay. Kieran's got an Irish ancestry, so he has a lot of cousins. I do. I've got exactly. All over the world. There's, uh, it's that Catholic... You're not allowed. It, that's that Catholic um, um, descendant. Where you, uh, uh, the culture is. Oh, sorry. The, <laughs> in Catholicism, if any of you don't know, you can't use contraception if you're a good Catholic. So a lot of babies get born, basically. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a that's nice polite way of saying it, Kieran. I was going to be much more vulgar. Yeah. It's a nice polite way of saying it. But um, and, uh, <laughs> as you know, uh, the Irish descendants are. There's more Irish descendancy just in America alone than there are people in Ireland, apparently. And really? Yeah, but but that's fascinating. I was thinking the other day. You know, well, why is it Ireland specifically that's like that? Wales was also you know, a poor country. Scotland, I'm sure, was uh, in poverty. Uh, Ireland has got a lot of immigrants. A lot of it, it was due to, to, to the, the, the famine in the eight, yeah. 1800s, and Britain was essentially to to blame uh, um, for some of the. I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but essentially, it's a potato famine, and, and the British said, who who obviously the. They were the rulers at the time of the Irish. They, they essentially said, "We're not going to help you with with. Um, we're not going to give you any food aid, and you've got to deal." I think you know something to, something like that. They one, a new government came into power and said, "We're going to stop the aid, giving you the food aid. Um, right. You have to figure out your own ways of feeding yourself." And uh, unfortunately, uh, it was a hundreds. Of, I think hundreds of thousands, if not millions. I don't know the statistic, the, the, the numbers off the top of my head. A lot of Irish people starved. The ones which didn't starve emigrated to uh, America, America and or, or elsewhere around the British Empire, and uh, uh, that's why so many people. I think it, it drained the population of Ireland. I think fell almost almost by fifty percent in in a sh- in a couple of decades because of this or less. I, I, again, I'm sorry. I apologise if the statistics aren't completely accurate, but roughly this is what happened. Uh, and this is why, and I, I don't blame them. I, I mean, if I was in Ireland at the time and there was no food, I'd get the hell out of there, and <laughs> I'd find someone. I get know. out of my house and there's no food. Well, yeah, I'm... quite. I mean, yeah, so, yeah it's something to do with potato blight, some disease, and obviously they couldn't counter it at the time. And I don't know what. Maybe it's to do with weather conditions. And anyway, as a consequence, you have a cousin in New York. Which I is have a, ex- well, yeah. a, a really nice way to end, end a sad story. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Yeah. Though I think, sorry, I think that it's only slightly related to that because my ah. my relatives in in New York, even though I'm sure I do have some relatives uh, in America for, for that reason as well. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> it was my my grandmother's sister who was English, and during the war, so that would be my great, like my great auntie, uh, during the war. Uh, she uh, um, she met an American soldier, American GI, as they say, and they got married. And she um, she she left with him for, for America. Well, so nice. yeah, so he was stationed in in Britain, and I think he was involved in some way with the 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 invasion of of, of well not invasion the defense <laughs> you could say of Europe against Nazi Germany. And after yes. the war, she went there. So that that's that's how those relatives are, are actually based in New York. But anyway, um, so I. The point is, I had a very busy week, and I didn't prepare as much as Paul has, so I can only apologise. But what I was going to do was quote from um, a source which I don't. I often try to avoid, and that is Wikipedia, <laughs> and only yeah. because I, I've used Wikipedia and I know the culture behind it and the, the some of the biases behind Wikipedia. And that's maybe one podcast we can talk about that just alone because it's quite extraordinary what happens when you start editing or attempting to edit things with even with legitimate and reliable oh, really? resources. Yeah, yeah, I can I can talk about that a little bit uh, <laughs> on, on Wikipedia. I'm sure you can. Yeah. But anyway, I've checked. I've checked, and most of the sources seem legitimate for this. But the main the main article comes from a Guardian article published a few years ago, and this is the story. I mean, the, the title of the article is i'm going to butcher the names now and it's even worse because i have a russian girlfriend who's probably going to uh, 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 give me a bit of a uh, an earful for 
<laughs> for butchering yeah, the yes. Russian names, but it's, uh, thank you, Vasily Arkhipov, the man who stopped nuclear war. And uh, this is the story of a um, s- the story of a Soviet Navy officer who who may have saved the world. Which sounds it sounds ludicrous to say that, like a Superman uh, <laughs> sort yeah. of um, uh, uh, a mythological uh, super Superman tale that one it individual could chat. stop this. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, um, so what I was going to do is is just give people the, the background of the, the so called. Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, or as the, I think as the Cubans call it, the October Crisis, and uh, the Russians call it the, the Caribbean Crisis, I think. And so this is a, uh, most of you who have studied um, history or political history or Cold War history will, will likely know about this, but it was a, a 13-day confrontation between the United States and Soviet Union. Again, I'm, I'm quoting directly from Wikipedia, so I apologise. This is professional, and we are doing our best job. <laughs> so, uh, it, between the, the Soviet Union and the United States, and it was it involved the crisis, according to the American, the crisis was the fact that the Soviet Union had placed uh, nuclear warheads uh, in Cuba, and uh, the, the responses to this. So, this was after, by the way, the date. This was from October the sixteenth to October the twenty eighth is generally considered by historians. Uh, um, the date of the crisis, how long it lasted in 1962. So this was um, after the failed Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961, where the uh, the CIA um, tra- trained, well, they, they trained previously the Cuban exiles and um, they tried to help them. They were going to help them overthrow um, the Castro regime, which had taken power a couple of years um, previously. And it was a dramatic failure. And uh, the CIA thought that, John F. Kennedy were gonna, was going to send in the U.S. Air Force to back up these these um, exiles, which had been trained by the CIA and, and, and given weapons and by the CIA, but he refused to, um, and the, the this invasion was quickly destroyed, and um, this, so part of it part of it was in response to this failed pair of pigs invasion, and the fact the other facts that, that historians usually talk about is that, is that America had missiles. Uh, Jupiter ballistic missiles apparently in Italy and Turkey which were obviously they were within range of Moscow and uh, so Kuroshev who was the leader of the USSR at the time he he um, spoke to Castro they had some secret meetings and he agreed to construct and to give some military aid to um, to Cuba and construct some, some missiles which could be launched uh, and obviously they were in with, well within range of continental U.S. and this caused a dramatic crisis. And uh, part of the the U.S., dis- the response by the U.S., part of it was a naval blockade around Cuba. They said nobody's going, uh, nobody's going in or out of there with military aid, essentially. And so uh, that's, that's the background. That's a very rough background. I apologise again if any of the facts are wrong. Please blame Wikipedia and not me. <laughs> and, uh, but, but to get to um, Vasily, the hero of the story... Uh, the really and again, I'm, I'm going to be mainly uh, uh, quoting from Wikipedia, but but part of it because I read a couple of news articles, but but the Wikipedia entry is actually very well uh, referenced and it seems quite relatively comprehensive and quite neutral. So you know, I'm not I'm not one of these completely anti Wikipedia people. There's some useful stuff on there, and just looking at the, the references section, you can get uh, further ideas of, of of the resources that you need to go to to find reliable information. But um, so it's. October the 27th, 1962, uh, and so the, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, as the, the US uh, calls it, was uh, still continuing. The blockade was still there. And so and a group of 11 United States Navy destroyers and aircraft, uh, the aircraft carrier, the USS Randolph, they were, they were trying to locate a, a nuclear-armed Soviet Foxtrot-class submarine, the B-59, which is near Cuba. And um, so despite and despite being in international waters, the Americans, they they started dropping depth charges, which are sort of like explosive, I think, similar to explosive mines. And they were trying to get the submarine to come to the surface uh, and for identification. Apparently, that was the strategy. Now, the problem is there's been no contact. The submarine had had no contact with Moscow in a number of days. And I think they were quite deep in the water and they they didn't have the radio communication uh, communications available at the time apparently and the submarine 
uh, had been picking up uh, U.S. civilian radio broadcasts, apparently. But once uh, once the, the, the B-59 submarine that the city was in uh, began, they, they began attempting to hide from the U.S., uh, but they, you know, they didn't. They didn't get any more communications. Now the the U.S. were trying to say basically that come to the surface for identification, and they were dropping these depth charges, these practice depth charges. But there were explosive devices, so if you're in the submarine, you're going to feel it, and it's going to look like you're under attack. I think by by some sort of undersea uh, water mines, which is one of the. Uh, which I believe is one of the military devices they use to to try and stop submarines. Um, and so those on board of the submarine, they they did not know whether war had broken out or not because it had been a few days and the crisis was still well underway and they, they thought they were under attack. And the captain of the submarine, uh, a Mr. A Valentin uh, Savitsky, he decided that war might have already started and he wanted to launch a nuclear torpedo. Uh, now, uh, under the Russian chain of command or the, the, the Russian regulations, uh, naval regulations, they had to get all three officers on board all had to um, come to a consensus to, to before a nuclear t- torpedo could be fired. So, and uh, again, I'm just quoting from Wikipedia. It says, unlike any other submarines in the flotilla, three officers on board the B-59 had to agree unanimously to authorise a nuclear launch. Um, Captain uh, uh, Savitsky, the political officer, Ivan uh, Maslenivok, I'm sorry, I'm I'm butchering these names. I really (laughs) apologise if you're a Russian speaker and and you're just really angry at me. Uh, They did a good job, you (laughs) And the second in command, which was um, uh, Arkhipov, who is the hero of the story. And uh, so... It says typically Russian submarines armed with what they called the special weapon, this nuclear warhead or nuclear torpedo, only required the captain to get authorization uh, from the political officer to launch the torpedo. However, um, Arkhipov's position uh, uh, as the flotilla commander of, of, of a lot of these submarines in the area, um, he, uh, you had to get permission from him. And apparently an argument broke out between the captain and the political officer, both of whom agreed to launch a nuclear torpedo, by the way, uh, at, uh, at the U.S. naval forces. I believe they wanted to aim it at the USS uh, the USS uh, Randolph, which was the uh, aircraft carrier at the time. And, of course, a nuclear torpedo, I believe, would have just completely incinerated that. And uh, uh, historians generally agree that this would have led to a larger nuclear conflict and World War Three, and in turn, most likely, the destruction of humanity or the destruction of a very large proportion of of humanity. And so, um, this uh, this is the story of of, of uh, this gentleman um, Vasily, who refused, who who disagreed with the two other officers on board and said and vetoed the launch of this nuclear torpedo and averted nuclear warfare because, of course, uh, war hadn't broken out. And uh, to me, I think the impo- I actually only discovered... And by the way, we're coming near to the anniversary of when this occurred. This is in October 27th, so we're getting closer to it. Now, I, I only read about this case, and I'd, I'd, I'd studied... Uh, Cold War history in uni- at the university level and at A level, and I thought I knew a fair amount about the Cuban Missile Crisis and what happened there, and you know I knew most of the ins and outs. But of course, it wasn't as granular as as as, as what happened in every submarine, and I actually had no idea that this this did occur and that the world was. Of course, everyone, all historians know that the world was close to nuclear war, but this was <laughs> as close as you can get. And I think for me, the, the thing I took away from this, from this story, was the importance of individual action when it comes to even up to even large scale uh, uh, political and historical events and movements. Because, OK, you can argue from one level, um, he was a man caught in a system and a structure in which, you know, he was a Navy officer and he had uh, he had a, a role to perform and and he'd been sent out there by 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 other powers and and you can talk about the greater structures but when it came down to this decision of the possibility of nuclear war world war 3 you have one one individual who may have completely saved the world by re- keeping his cool and refusing to he vetoing his two other officers who he was arguing with to a uh, uh, to a, 
you know, he vetoed, he vetoed their, their decision. They wanted to fire a nuclear torpedo at US forces, which almost inevitably would have led to, to World War Three. And, 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 and it, to me, it's extraordinary that that one individual like that, 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 that you can have this hero character very much in, in history and that individual action um, is still plays such a key role. And a lot of political scientists and I think historians and other and sociologists and other social scientists, we focus so much on the structure and the systems in place and these large scale forces which shape humanity whether it's capitalism or other ideologies and ideas which don't get me wrong are extraordinarily important and i would not deny their significance whatsoever but at the same time this very granular human level where a person's action their agency where they can just say no i'm not doing this i refuse to do it i'm not allowing you to do it even under severe pressure and he he he, he may have well saved humanity <laughs> Uh, and it may be one reason why we're sitting here the way and the, in the way we are today talking. And I just thought it's really extraordinary to think about that and really reflect on, on how important individual decisions can be because you think it might not have a wider impact. Now, not, not all of us are going to be sitting in nuclear submarines deciding whether to fire a missile at another country or not, of course. Um, but but yeah. at the same time, I think it's worth... Um, really worth reflecting on and uh, to me uh just the significance of it was was quite mind-blowing and i just and the finding out about this because i thought i knew again the other the other minor more minor thing to take away is i always you know never be too uh, arrogant when it comes to history because uh, i think it's a famous quote by truman actually who says you know that the only things well the only thing that's really new is is the history that you don't know i mean you f you find out so much like this and it really sort of made me think about about the world and anyway i'm going to stop talking now and I'm I'll let, I'll let Paul uh, give give his opinion about it, but but that's why I picked the article. I thought it was fascinating. No, it's brilliant. I, I think I think it's such a true point to make that we we look at the macro elements of history so so often because it's the most efficient and the easiest, but we really forget the the minor parts, the the, the micro parts where these human stories come out. And uh, what I what I what I find is for me fascinating about it is that it's actually so logical that events like this happen. We, I think it's quite illogical for us to think that there's a great structure that 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 works properly and is inhuman and in being kind of removed from from emotion and and quick impulsive reactions. Actually, we are humans. We, we put ourselves in power, powerful positions, and the consequence can be that people make mistakes where we, they would fire back in this person situation. Uh, they they would fire back and they would. They would, you know, make the mistake of thinking they are in the war. Uh, or they would, they would react wrongly. It's kind of the opposite of what we were saying earlier with politicians who look at, or anybody who looks at global corporations who look at the the money side and forget the the human side of the people they work with. They look at the macro and not the micro in a weird way. Um, they don't think about the individuals who get affected by their actions. It's the same here. Uh, we we as a people expect that the powers above us are kind of inhuman and in being calculated and reasonable in, in very heated environments. So it, it's, a, it's a great story. I really enjoyed it. It's, it's, a, it, it's such a kind of uh, hawk, I say. It's such a reflection of what's inevitably, what will inevitably be brought up. It's a reflection of the strange love and the atomic bomb. Yes. You know, yeah. Which is just, which greatly depicts the, hu the, hu the human mistakes we make and the people we trust with with these positions. Um, well, I was saying to you, like, Kieran, actually, what I found interesting, I, I researched very quickly as well a bit more about this subject, and I came upon two top two articles, one by a chap called Richard Reeves. Uh, he was writing for the NY Times. In an article, I think it's more academic, by uh, another man called Greg Thielman, T-H-I-E-L-M-A-N-N. -N. He was a senior fellow of the Arms Control Association. Both articles gave me, like you're saying, a different perspective, uh, new history, where they told me that actually they argued there was no missile gap, uh, that McNamara actually came out and said this. McNamara, I think, was the, was he the vice president or the Ven defense secretary of the U.S. at the time? I believe he was the defense secretary. Yeah, I think he's defense as well. Yeah, he, he, was in a, he basically was in a kind of conference with journalists, which he thought uh, legally they couldn't report, but actually they could report it. It was a big mess up, essentially. And he revealed himself personally, he said there was no missile gap, according to this NY Times article and this other, other chap, Thielman. Um, so it turned out actually the CIA were reporting that the Soviets didn't have 
many missiles at all. They had about seven, the three intercontinental ballistic missiles in 1960, uh, 1961. The Americans had 108 missiles that could reach the Soviet Union. So it's a very big disparity there between, in terms of missile gap, it, it actually America were dominating the Soviets in terms of how much they could, how, how, how dangerous and lethal their arms were, mm. uh, which it, it's really important still, you know, uh, the same article where Thielman talks about a national intelligence estimate, it's a report in 1999 about how Iran, with the Soviet Union's help, uh, could test their own intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, this didn't happen for years afterwards. So this, this this report believed that Iran would have missiles, but didn't have missiles. But they they changed their rhetoric so that they didn't talk about what was it, what was what was actually happening. They're talking about what could happen. Uh, it's very relevant now because obviously Iran had their nuclear deal recently. So it, it's just it's just this revelation about what we perceive to be uh, an absolute truth that there was a missile gap, common commonly believed, officially sanctioned report of the situation was wrong and we're still getting reports now about Iran or Syria or Iraq with its chemical weapons uh, it's interesting how the government's misleaded us in the past about the, the, the true events this missile gap in particular it, it was such a significant couple of decades which revolved around this and our whole lives were kind of lived on a fear as a consequence it's, it's crazy that we were misled in such a way no, you're right. I mean, for and a contemporary example of this sort of uh, of, of actively elements within a, a, a government actively seeking to bias or falsify um, um, intelligence or, or, or evidence about other states, of course, is is the Second Gulf War. I mean, the invasion of Iraq and the so-called WMDs and the so-called links to 9/11, which, of course. Uh, were completely not true and any I think independent uh, analyst any independent member of the public could just use open source intelligence at the time and and find a lot of contradictory stuff saying well actually um, you know uh, the, the idea that that Saddam Hussein has large stockpiles of, of weapons of mass destruction is quite ridiculous uh, and the fact that he may have had links to 9-11s even more uh, and Al Qaeda is even more uh, uh, it's absurd. Mark. Yeah. yeah, and uh, it, it, it's really worrying. And like you said, so-called allegedly independent uh, intelligence uh, um, reports and, and analysis can themselves be completely skewed and uh, biased by just for purely political means. And uh, I mean more so than just sort of propping up state, a status quo, but, but actively allowing certain, but maybe particularly right-wing elements of. Of, of a state or, or, or government to get their way with what they believe national security is about. I mean, and, uh, you know, a lot of this comes from the so-called hawks. And uh, I've, as soon as you talk about missile gap and the fact that, that America needs to, you know, this idea America needs to have more weapons, I immediately think of the military-industrial complex, you know, this nexus between military con uh, um, industrial arms corporations and 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 uh, military contractors and uh, politicians and, and generals and this sort of iron triangle of interests where everyone wants the same thing even if that thing is destructive and 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 is based on false evidence there's too many too many winners in the elite or, or this elite faction in in many parts of society especially uh, america so why would you why would you stop it so uh, you know politicians get their get their military bases and get their contracts for the people that they represent so they get jobs in the districts that they represent so they get re-elected and the generals uh, they get to satisfy their view of, 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 of what is national security and they may be secure lucrative jobs once they retire and the corporations of course get huge government uh, uh, some you know sums of money from the government for these contracts for new technology and it, and it doesn't stop because there's too many people who make too much money from it and it's quite, it's scary because it, 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 it directly, again, directly affects the culture, the way we view the world, all of these so-called um, independent and unbiased reports that can come out, which are com just complete nonsense, completely skewed and completely biased in every shape, uh, in, in every way. And it, it, and it can lead, and it can lead, as we've seen with the invasion of Iraq in 2003, to a large scale war, which takes the lives of hundreds of thousands uh, of people, if not if not over a million people, but we shan't get into that, that debate, that <laughs> quite divisive, yeah. uh, controversial debate right now. But uh, it's, it's, it really does worry me. And yeah, it definitely highlights that. And just getting back to the 
um, the article uh, um, about uh, Vasily. Again, it, it highlights the madness, the real, the real crazy man. I mean, nuclear weapons in particular haven't gone away, and that threat. Uh, you might think it's completely dissipated, but with what's happened uh, over the last couple of years, um, apparent, apparently, some from some news reports, I can't quite off the top of my head, uh, uh, generals in the Pentagon, their, 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 their plans uh, about how to deal with Russia, which have been collecting dust for the last t- couple of decades while they've been focusing on other issues, and they're coming off the shelves and... You know, tactical nuclear war is becoming apparent, according to, in their eyes, is becoming a real issue they need to really think about again, which is quite extraordinary and quite scary um, by what they believe is this renewed Russian aggression. Uh, and it is worrying that another situation uh, and could occur relatively easily, you know, and it, it could happen in our lifetimes. You think this is, you know, you, you can think about, well, this is the 60s and the, it was the height of the Cold War to a certain extent, and and uh, this is a very unique time and situation. But I think I think history can repeat itself, and and it, and it will repeat itself. And then we might not be so lucky to have a Vasily, uh, a Vasily Arkhipov in the submarine vetoing the decision this time. And and that's that's a that's a real worry. Definitely, uh, I think it's a great way to end it as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh. All right. Well, so okay, we'll call it a day. Thank you, uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, those listeners who are there. And uh, thank you, Paul. We had a really uh, good conversation, I feel. Great. I thought it was a very interesting debate. Uh, not debate, but discussion in general. Uh, and I thank everyone who listened as well. And hopefully hear from you guys soon. Yeah. Bye for now. Well, sorry, you can hear from us soon. Yeah, we'll hear from us. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now.